from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of Veeam on 2020. Brought to you by Veeam. Hi everybody, welcome back to Veeam on 2020. My name is Dave Vellante and you're watching the Cube's coverage of Veeam on. This is the first time we've done virtual Veeam on and we've got the, the Veeam power panel, Bill Largent, CEO, Jim Kruger, the CMO, Danny Allen, who's the CTO and Senior Vice President of Product Strategy, all have been on uh, earlier. Guys, great to see you. Thanks for coming back and digging out of the power panel. Appreciate it. Good. Thank you, Dave. Glad to, great glad to be here. here. Thank you. Okay, I want to start off, uh, Bill, Bill, get a, get a business update. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about COVID. We can go back to that, but you guys, uh, you know, as a private company, you divulge more information than, than most private companies. And we appreciate that as an independent, but guys, if you would bring up that, that one slide, you know, you shared this uh, publicly uh, a little earlier. I mean, you guys are at a, a, a billion in revenue now, 21% annual uh, recurring revenue growth, 375,000 customers, 97% year on year increase in your universal uh, license bookings. Uh, Everything seems to be happening, Bill. What uh, what can you tell us? Well, we had a uh, we had a great first quarter also that we kicked off where we had our, our transaction with um, Insight Venture Partners, which you know right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of that quarter, at the end of it, we had that activity that went on. Uh, that one might think would uh, have disrupted the business. It didn't. We had our plan for Q1. Really excited about that. We announced our growth. We saw that here recently. We're really uh, pumped into our. Uh, Pumped into our second quarter, we, we managed to transition everybody out of offices. We probably had 70% of our workforce, 75% of our workforce that need to move. Uh, they did that. We had a fantastic April. We're having a very good May. So it's just a great start uh, with a great customer base. So really excited about it. Yeah, you mentioned Insight. We obviously covered that um, and, and reported on that. Uh, Insight, they like growth. You know, it's not, not like the old school private equity, just you know, suck money out. They want growth. They, they want options down the road, optionality. Maybe it's a rule of 40, rule of, you know, the type of company. So that's got to be exciting uh, for you guys and, and your employees. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty exciting. We've been around, a uh, few of us have been around the Insight team since 2002. So uh, a very well-known group of individuals to us. Uh, they are focused in the software space. They know the infrastructure space really well. Uh, Mike Triplett, our uh, our lead on the uh, Insight team, and his um, his staff has uh, helped us uh, move into Act Two, or as we move into Act Two and stepping up and moving into our annual recurring revenue focus versus more of a total contract value focus. But uh, nice uh, nice resource to have for things that we might want to do in the future related to acquisitions. So we're really excited about it. I mean, if I'm in VC right now, I'm I'm looking at SaaS, I'm looking at software, I'm looking for companies that have a, 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 an annual recurring revenue model. I'm looking for adoption of, of products and, and those kind of KPIs. And you guys fit that bill at maybe a larger size than obviously than an early stage startup, but that's kind of the profile of the, 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 the company that you want to invest in in the 2020s, isn't it? Absolutely, and I'd also say it's the kind of uh, company we want to invest in in the future as we go forward to bring in new technologies and expand market aggressive marketplace. Uh, back to comments we had discussions on or what's it look like in 2030? And it's like, yeah. those are the places we're heading from. So, so Danny, Pat Gelsinger is famous on theCUBE for saying that, look, if you don't ride the waves, it's going to become driftwood. So what are the mega trends that you guys are riding uh, today and that you're seeing in the future that, that will keep you ahead of the pack? Well, we clearly talk a lot about cloud data management. So Act 2 for us is not just moving from perpetual licensing to subscription and evolving with the market at a business level, it's also at a technical level. And so we invested heavily, as you know, we demoed earlier today, being back up for Office 365 version five. It's an important point, Act 2 for us is not just product, it's also product delivery. That's version five of, of a release of a product that came out three years ago. So Veeam Backup for Office 365, we showed you Veeam Backup for AWS, and you saw from Anton as well, uh, supporting Google Cloud storage and supporting all of the major cloud providers. So for us to not just ride the wave, but actually be ahead of everyone else, it's to embrace cloud data management and give the customers what they really need. Well, I think you guys are in a unique position too. I mean, 
you know, if you're, if you, you guys obviously sell on-prem, but if you're, you're, if you're an on-prem infrastructure company that's really living on box margins, um, you know, you, you could talk the cloud talk, but it's not necessarily a tailwind for you guys. But, so Danny, how is cloud, explain how cloud is a tailwind for Veeam, uh, you know, versus some of the other legacy players. Well, Veeam has always been, we always highlight simple, flexible, reliable, but one of the, the parts of flexible, of course, is being software defined. And we've been software defined from the very beginning. And if you're in a world where you have to go take a box, plug it into the data center and rack and stack it and do, uh, you know, be there physically, you're not going to survive in this type of environment. So being software defined helped us not only to win the data center, but to help our customers as they go through that evolution from on-prem to maybe just storing backups in the cloud to actually running their workloads in the cloud and protecting them there. So Jim, I want to I want to turn it to you. Sort of thinking about the Veeam brand. Uh, I, I we talked earlier about how you guys have always punched above your weight, famous parties and so forth. But now you you're billion dollars now entering a a, a new era. Uh, with you know not, it's ironic that we're now doing you know virtual events. So no big giant party this year. But I feel like I mean you guys are what 14 year old company now and you're kind of kind of grown up. You. You three and your colleagues are bringing, you know, lots of adult supervision. How should we think about the, the Veeam on or Veeam brand going forward? Yeah, no, I think the, the Veeam brand is critically important because uh, there's just a, such a strong affinity and connection with customers. And I think one of the challenges as you get larger and go from 1 billion to 2 billion, uh, a lot of companies miss the beat relative to staying connected to their customers. And that's something that we're putting a tremendous amount of focus on. That first slide that you see, you, you flashed up, you know, 91% uh, you know, sa customer satisfaction, a 75 uh, net promoter score, which is three and a half times industry average. Uh, I think our key to success is, is not only bringing great products to market, but looking at the holistic picture relative to supporting customers and customer satisfaction, which is a key driver of the company. Uh, will, will help us to continue to build on the brand and, and have you know, the, the best brand in the market. Well, so I, I want to come back to you as the, you know, as the, the marketing whiz in the, in the panel. I mean, you think about digital, it, we feel like the war is going to be won in digital in the next decade. I take the, you take the GNC example, and you think about you know, just even the term like customer relationship management, you know, we all use CRM systems, but I'm not sure I want a, a, a relationship with GNC, but I do know this, I want a good deal, right? If they're going to make me an offer, I'm going to I'm going to look at that and, and these other brands, uh, and and that's digital. That is having infrastructure and data that's obviously protected to be able to offer that at the right time to the right customer, so they can take advantage of it and have the right channels. I wonder if you could talk about what you see as a a, a marketing pro, just in terms of digital and and that customer intimacy. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think it, it's uh, multifaceted. I think one of the key things that that again Veeam does that's different than other uh, companies is that uh, we we have a direct connection with our customers. So, you know, our head of product management sends out an update every Sunday and goes into uh, you know quite a bit of detail around sort of how to deploy this, how to deploy that, uh, and and really uh, creating a, a digital journey for the customer from a marketing perspective. Because yeah. Like within any situation, you know, you, you don't want to talk to a salesperson right off the bat because you know they're going to try to sell you. Uh, so you want to do some investigation. You need the, the content and information to help you move along that journey uh, until you get to the point where, okay, now it's time. I've kind of narrowed it down and, uh, and I need to talk to someone to give me some more information. So I look at, you know, one of the key um, differentiators of Veeam is, is that digital prowess. Uh, which I think from the founding of the company that Ratner put into place, uh, you know, has carried us, us forward and, and we continue to put a lot of focus on that digital experience, uh, which I think gives us definitely a leg up on the competition. So Bill, you got to place bets as the CEO. Um, I'm interested in where you're placing bets. I mean, you've, you've made some pretty substantial investments in the, your partner uh, network. Uh, you've got some big name partners that are, you're moving a lot of product you know, through those guys. Obviously your heritage as a company is, is steep in technical development. Uh, you, you are a very successful sales organization, but sir, where are you placing your chips on the table these days? And, and maybe 
especially in the context of, of this pandemic, if anything has changed in your thinking. Yeah, well, the bets will always be placed on the product side of it. Uh, that's, a, that's a big, so you go products, you go partners, and you go our employees, and those are the big bets that we'll make. What are we doing on the partner side? We're continuing a, a, a pretty aggressive activity and making sure these partners have a simpler place, as I've discussed uh, before, to do business with that gets more challenging the larger we get, uh, but yet we'll keep that focus on it. The product offering has been, uh, again, always go back to any of our taglines that just work, put us in the lab, we're going to win, we're going to win that technical decision uh, process. And then we're putting uh, pretty big bets on our employee base. Uh, we're all over the world, 4,300. Uh, uh, I think the decisions we have, like a lot of companies have moving forward, are going to be, where are you going to work from? Are you going to work from that home office? Are you going to combine it back into the office? Or are you going to not? You're just going to, you know, you're going to go back to the way things are. I don't think that's going to happen at all. So, so our bets will always be on bringing, bringing good product to marketplace, good technical decisions. So let's, let's talk to Andy about the product. Um, I mean, you've, as I was saying, you're, you've grown up, you've gone from you know, relatively narrow you know, portfolio to now one that's expanding a lot of different use cases, many, many, you know, several different clouds, on-prem, hybrid, et, et cetera. Um, how do you ensure, Danny, from a, from a product standpoint, that you don't just get a, a collection of point products, that you actually have you know, a platform that even, you know, for instance, your licensing model can very easily you know, support that that, that notion. Um, how, how do you ensure that you're more of a platform, if you will, than just a bunch of collection of products? The answer to that would be focus, maniacal focus. So it's interesting that you brought up licensing. So one of the things that we're very focused on is making sure that licensing can move across all these different types of infrastructure. So, you know, Veeam Universal License allows you to do that. You can move a workload from physical to virtual, to cloud, to back, to um, the application services, all with a, with a single license. But we also do that at a product level too. One of the interesting things that we've been focused on is something internally, we, we call it the Veeam integration platform, but enables you to have a, a central common control plane across the entire organization, but yet you can deploy in the native environments that make the most sense. So if you think about what we showed you earlier today with Veeam Backup for AWS, you're running on a, an interface that you deploy out of the AWS marketplace, but that product actually integrates back into Veeam Availability Suite. And so that's true of Veeam Backup for AWS, Veeam Backup for Azure, Veeam Backup for Nutanix. Every time we, we add a new capability across the platform, whether it's SaaS or virtual or cloud, we make sure that it still has that central connection to the, the main control plane. And that's why we call this cloud data management because it gives you that data management across all of these different infrastructures. It's, it's clearly not easy to do, but the focus that we put on this results in our customers' success uh, ultimately. So I want to ask you guys about culture, Jim, I'll start with you. I mean, a lot of people, obviously, I'm sure you've heard it or asking, hey, is, is Veeam still going to have parties? Uh, you know, they, you got your two founders who sort of, you know, set the, the, the notion of the culture. You, you know, Ratmir would be, always be right there in the mix, last, last one to leave, uh, and, you know, very hard charging. And that's kind of steep in, in the Veeam culture. But I'm interested in, in, in if, if there's been any just sort of discernible change as you get bigger and bigger, how you're able to maintain that culture. You know, what, what are some of the things that you want to, want to keep and maybe some of the things that you want to evolve? Yeah, no, great question. And, and I think culture is, I'm, I'm a big believer you know, that culture can, can really differentiate a company in the marketplace. And I think Veeam's culture uh, in the past ha has really done that effectively. And I think that's, you know, shows in the success of the company. So I definitely see it uh, as, you know, as my job along with the rest of the executive team to continue to, to carry that torch forward. Uh, one of the things that you know I learned coming to Veeam was was really winning the hearts and minds of of the you know the customers that you're serving, and so that that can be anything from a party, uh, being totally open to your customers, listening to your customers, uh, giving them different channels to give you feedback, uh, and just being a company that's easy to do business with. I think is critically important, and those are some of the key things from a cultural perspective uh, that uh, we want to carry forward. You mentioned hard charging. Absolutely, being being aggressive in the marketplace, uh, but bringing solutions to market that really hit the sweet spot uh, relative to customer need, I, I think is again one of the, the cultural pieces 
uh, and that maniacal uh, focus on customer satisfaction, uh, which is absolutely key. So, uh, well, I, I wonder, uh, Bill, if you could comment, and maybe in this context, you know, part of your job, of course, is TAM expansion. You've traditionally been a, a European-based company. You're moving HQ to the U.S. Um, curious as to what effect that will have, both culturally and on and on TAM as well. You're extremely successful uh, in in overseas, uh, of course. So there's maybe even more penetration within the U.S. And obviously, you know, throughout the globe, we've certainly talked a lot about cloud. But maybe your thoughts on those points. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Well, really, hopefully you see no impact on culture in the sense of our move from um, a European headquarters to a U.S. headquarters. We definitely felt it important to bring a U.S. headquarters in place. We you know, now have moved all U.S. shareholders. Uh, so it's really critical. Our, our culture is really built on uh, core values that we developed back in 2012 that really the, everything else branches off of. It's about product innovate and iterate. It's about everybody sells. We clearly have that uh, uh, goal for everyone in the company and in, in the fact that we also want to win. So we'll fight hard to win. Bringing it to the U.S., you know, our, a lot of our competitors are based in the U.S. We think we can put up a, uh, uh, even though we've got great numbers against all of our competitors, will even uh, bring the fight much harder uh, now that we're in the United States as a headquarter place, but um, change nothing else internationally, globally so, focused. So Danny, every I don't know, five or seven years or so, you know, Gartner, or IDC, or whomever put down the survey that says, yeah, we just did a survey that you know, X percent of the customers are going to rethink their backup strategies in the, in the next 24 months. You, you see that literally every half a decade. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the, Driving that now, I mean, certainly cloud is a, is a huge factor. Edge, we're going to be talking to edge for the next many, many years. And then, then it's really going to start to drive revenue at some point, kind of like the cloud was 10 years ago. Uh, but, but so talk about how you guys sort of stay relevant in, in that conversation and what customers should be thinking about in terms of those transitions. Well, you know, every, every customer says, I'm going to reevaluate my backup solution every, you know, five or seven years. But the, the reality is what's happened is the in industry itself goes through transition. So we go from physical to virtual. And as they go to virtual, for example, they say, hey, I can't use my legacy provider, so I'm going to choose a new one. And they, they choose Veeam. And then, of course, we go to cloud and we're going to go to containers and we're going to go to edge. And every time we go through those iterations, there is an opportunity for the next generation of platform uh, to emerge. And so Veeam's focus here is to make sure that we're ahead of those trends, to make sure we're thinking ahead of our customers. So right now, for example, you know, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about cloud and containers so that when the customer gets there, when they get to edge, when they get to all of these things, that they have a data management platform that, that protects them. And step one is always going to be the same. I always say the step one for, for every iteration of infrastructure is just ingest the data because you need to protect it. It's only after you protect it and begin to manage it, begin to integrate it into the business, can you begin to unleash it. But we go through this cycle over and over again. And ultimately, it's the, it's the, the vendor, it's the partner that is most trusted that wins. And as, as Jim alluded to, our NPS scores speak for themselves. Our customer base speaks for itself. Uh, self, our, our intimacy with the customer speaks for itself. And so as long as we keep that close connection, then we think we're well positioned to, to lead as we go through the next iteration of infrastructure. Okay, let's talk about the competition. Danny, let's stay with you. You know, you've got some well-funded, not even startups anymore, but you know, companies that are kind of going after the base. You've got a huge install base of, of legacy companies. I mean, I think it's easier for, for some of those guys to attack, you know, sort of a box base solution, you guys are more software, but I'm sort of interested in, in your take, Danny, on, on why Veeam, how you compete with the, the, sh the shiny new toys and uh, <laughs> that have obviously have momentum in the marketplace. Yeah, you know, the, the shiny new toys, they, they come out with a solution that is very packaged up and black box. You can't actually uh, customize it very much for the user need. And that's, we don't believe that that's going to work in the long term. And the reason I say that, look, the pandemic we're in, if you can't go into the data center to rack and stack a box, if you can't actually work with the infrastructure that's already in place, then you're not positioned to work well in the long term. And, and so we have this unfair advantage. We've been around 
for over a decade. We integrate with over 45 different storage vendors. That's not including the cloud vendors and you know, all of our partners. And so we do have an unfair advantage with the history of all of these integrations. But, th but that flexibility is really what our customers need. They don't want to be locked into the data center. They don't know. Two, three years from now, their strategy might change. They might say, take the workload, move it to the cloud. And so if your whole focus is on selling your customers something that ties them to their data center, that in itself is a challenge. And, and being software defined, we're, we're well positioned to make them future proof for any evolutions that, that happen in the marketplace. So we're in a good place. I'm, you know, well, knock on wood, but I think we're going to keep going. Yeah, that's an interesting answer, Danny, and not one that I expected, but it, it kind of makes sense in the context of a, a Q&A we had with uh, Andy Jassy in theCUBE a while ago, and I was kind of pushing him on you know, the zillion APIs, and he basically had a similar answer. Obviously, cloud services is different, but essentially saying, we don't know where the market's going, so we want to have very granular control at, at you know, kind of a primitive level. Uh, so that we have that flexibility. And maybe there's a trade-off, you know, sometimes just in terms of what you called out of the box, but it's a very Andy Jassy-like answer uh, uh, sort of strikes me. <laughs> well, it, it's certainly true that the, you know, customers don't know a year from now, uh, they've been using, you know, that hardware, but a year from now, two years from now, we run into another market impediment. They might want that money back. They might want, might want flexibility to expand into a different geography or, take advantage, advantage of the elasticity of the cloud and, and buying a piece of hardware, just the very fact that you buy hardware, that essentially ties you into that hardware for the next at least three years probably. Being software defined, you can continue to, to reuse and leverage all the assets that you already have without committing to a lock-in for the next period of time. So, so from, a, from a marketing standpoint, Jim, strategy, brand, uh, customer intimacy, why, why Veeam? What's your, what's your answer? Well, Danny already talked a little bit about it in terms of uh, you know, kind of the, the three cornerstones of, of, of how we think are simplicity, flexibility, and reliability. Uh, and um, you know, as Bill talked about, you know, when, when we get into, you know, into a customer and if they're, they're testing us out, trialing us out, uh, nine times out of ten, we're going to win uh, because they see they see those three key things, and those three key things uh, we hear on a daily basis from our customers how important that is. So we continue to build out on each of those. Uh, the challenge is keeping it simple, uh, and that's an area that we we have to continue to focus on. Uh, but I think those are the, the 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 key differentiators for us going going forward. I think the flexibility piece is the integration with all the storage, our ecosystem of partners. Uh, we have, uh, I think, close to 40 partners that are sponsoring uh, Veeamon here. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's a key differentiator because we, we work across uh, basically everybody. We're agnostic. Uh, and again, just easy to do business with and, and a true partner. I got, a, I got one more question for Danny and then I want to I ask Bill to close, but guys feel free to chime in on this one as well. But some of the things we haven't talked about much, Danny, uh, containers, protecting containers, uh, the edge, you know, these are all sort of emerging opportunities. I know you've got some partners, you know, on the container side, the, the edge is early days, but there's, you know, whole new models of computing, you know, potentially a lot of data going to be, be created. Unclear how much is going to have to be persisted, but certainly with that much data, you know, the IDC forecasts, a lot of it's going to have to be protected. So your thoughts on some of those other emerging trends that we haven't talked about. Well, the key to this segment of the market, are our partners trust us. We're thinking about this ahead of when they will actually need it. And you're right, I think we're early days in containers. I think we're early days in edge. We don't know, you know, we have a partner, Ducks Unlimited, where they're storing data for 60 years, use it from IoT sensors, and they keep it for 60 years because they don't know in the future if that data is going to be relevant. And so our focus is to make sure that we're ahead of our customer base in terms of thinking of it, and then making sure that our, our platform supports what they need as they need it. So you'll, you'll want to be careful about going too far in advance. Sometimes in the industry you hear about, you know, people who are talking about magic pixie dust and solving <laughs> crazy problems that our customers don't actually have. We're very pragmatic. We want to make sure that the problems that we're addressing that are that our platform fundamentally addresses where they are today, and then also be in those discussions with them about where they're going to be tomorrow. Well, maybe some of that magic pixie dust will go into uh, 
the COVID vaccine. That would be good. Or <laughs> therapeutics. Uh, Bill, bring us home. So, you know, the, the virtual forklifts are breaking down VMON 2020. What are the big takeaways from your, your first VMON as CEO? You've been to many, I'm, you know, I know, but, but what are the big takeaways as the, as the virtual trucks are pulling away? Yeah, no, uh, thanks very much for asking that question. We, uh, you know, we did do our first VMON in 2014, and I can still remember when Ratmir came to me and said, "Let's let's do this." And it's like, "Oh, you got to be kidding me! This is going to cost a fortune. Uh, why would we ever?" And then he's obviously uh, right, uh, continues to be right. So, hey, the story about Veeam is growth. And when you're growing, you got funds available, and people interested you to innovate. Uh, you mentioned containers. Danny did also, and uh, Kubernetes, and you know, we've got our friends at Casting that are here with us, and. Now, those are all important relationships and we'll continue to develop relationships that are like this. But why Veeam? Uh, why we've supported, we've got great customer support. We have uh, a growth engine. We're going to continue that. We don't plan on being comfortable with where we are. We'll continue to enter and go after a, um, additional TAM, but we'll also take care of that core base we came from. So uh, really excited about where we've done. We've, we had a lot, of, a lot of great breakout sessions. Uh, I keep, um, I, you know, Kubernetes was on, there was a lot of great ones. I did like the one though, and it was like fall in love with tape all over again. So when I first saw that, and they brought that to my attention, it's like, ah, I went running for my eight track tapes and my uh, John Fogarty and CCR, I found one. Um, so uh, I had to get readjusted. Ah, oh, that's not what they need. Uh, so in any event, I do think uh, we like to have a lot of fun. You'll see that we get back to a, uh, uh, see where we go as far as a virtual versus a, an on site. Um, uh, Veeam on in the future, we plan an on-site one, and if so, you'll, and you're there, you'll, you'll, we'll be at the party. Yeah, indeed, and I, but I do think there's going to be some learnings that we carry forward, and, uh, you know, I think for a while, and maybe even for quite a long time, there'll be some kind of hybrid going on. We just seem to live in a hybrid world. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and making this a successful power panel. It was really a pleasure having you. Great, thanks thank for you, having us. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Keep it right there, our continuous coverage of Beam On 2020. We're right back.